Thank you very much, and merhaba uh, to all the attendees in the in the training session. Um, so basically, the idea is that I will go through our presentation, and uh, I will, you know, um, more often than not, will ask if you have any questions or comments. So I encourage uh, attendees in this session to to you know to comment and to do whatever questions you you might want to do. And I'll do my best to to reply. Um, so the idea is that it's is not so much a lecture, but rather an an interactive um, session. Um, so my name is Omar Hernandez. I am from Venezuela, and I work at the United Nations Academic Impact um, Initiative here at the Department of Global Communications in the UN Secretariat um, in New York, which is, by the way, uh, in right in front of the permanent mission of of Turkey to the United Nations is literally across the street from, from the building. Um, so it, we are privileged to be here um, joining this session. And this is part of the ongoing efforts of the United Nations Academic Impact to promote and advocate for the Sustainable Development Goals, mm, particularly timely this session because just a few days from now, we will have here the SDG Summit. Um, which will take place uh, on Monday and Tuesday with world leaders from around the world. Uh, we will have uh, an activation weekend this weekend. And the SDG Summit will be followed by the high-level segment of the General Assembly that I'm sure most of you have seen on TV, where world leaders, heads of state and government from around the world come to New York. Um, actually, the preparations are, are taking place as I, as I speak uh, downstairs with the security and arrangements and all that. So we are expecting to welcome over 150 presidents, prime ministers and the like uh, here in, in New York. Um, and the, the basic um, focus, I would say, of, of this in gathering, the largest diplomatic gathering in the, on the planet, precisely are the SDGs. Um, and the reason why the SDGs are so important nowadays is because we are in the midpoint. And the, the, the, the overview, the panorama, uh, the situation concerning the achievement of these goals doesn't seem very promising, um, particularly not only because of the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic, but also um, the, the, the effects, the devastating um, consequences of, of, the, of the current war in Ukraine. So the combination of these factors and others have caused uh, a tremendous impact, particularly in the developing world. Uh, so why are we talking about the SDGs and why are we talking about the role of universities in the SDGs is what I'm going to, to address during my presentation. Um, so let, let me let me start with that. Um, could you confirm that you can see the slides? Yeah. We can see your uh, PowerPoint presentation. OK, so first and foremost, uh, allow me to introduce myself. Um, as I said, I'm the program manager of the UN Academic Impact. Before that, I used to work um, with the UN um, Climate Change Secretariat in Bonn. Before that, I was a consultant for the Education for Justice initiative of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime in Vienna. I work as a journalist, as an international news analyst uh, for over five years in a Venezuelan newspaper. And uh, in that position, I had uh, assignments as correspondent at the United Nations in Geneva covering the Human Rights Council. And for more than 15 years, I used to be a lecturer at the university also in Venezuela, teaching international human rights law, international public law, and international journalism. So I transitioned from academia to the media to the United Nations and it's it's a uh, it's a privilege to be able to connect the organization with universities and I don't know for a fact how critically important universities are for the work of the United Nations so as you can see in this slide this very first slide you see the SDGs wheel which are probably very well known um, uh, among you but also the lesser known logo of the decade of action for the SDGs precisely under the assumption that the time to theorize, to discuss about the SDGs and to see how feasible the SDGs are or not, or to, to explore how relevant the SDGs are or not, that time has passed and is behind us. 
because again, we are at the midpoint um, concerning the, the achievement of, of these sustainable development goals. But before we go into that, let me go a little bit through what, what can we understand as uh, UNAI and the role of, of, of this program. We are an initiative that engages institutions of higher education around the world with the UN. Uh, of course, the UN is an intergovernmental organization composed by member states. Uh, but since the inception of the UN, actually in the UN charter, there are expressed references to the role of civil society, for instance, and over the course of many, many years, in the past few decades, the UN has increased its engagement with the private sector, with the entertainment industry, with the creative community, with sports clubs and associations, with um, elementary schools and high schools, uh, multinational companies, and of course, higher education institutions, which is why we were created back in 2010 by former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. So the idea is that uh, we engage with these universities and colleges in supporting and contributing to the realization of the UN's purposes and principles, which are enshrined in the UN Charter. And of course, we are a diverse network of students, um, academic researchers and more, although the affiliation to UNAI is institutional. Um, of course, through this institutional affiliation, we connect with pretty much everybody in these institutions. And as of now, we are over 1,600 member institutions, which are universities or colleges, in more than 150 countries. We also have, on an exceptional basis, some associations of universities. Uh, we also have the Academic Council on the United Nations System, the International Studies Association, and, and other stakeholders, which, although by definition not universities and colleges is strict or sensu, they are also very important for the work that we do. And we also have a system of universities and colleges serving as hubs to foster the fundamental principles of UNAI as well as the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, every single university, including yours, whenever they join UNAI, assume a commitment to use higher education as a tool to, to build capacity, to, to expand um, educational opportunities for all, to encourage global citizenship, um, to promote and advocate for human rights, intercultural dialogue, um, advance peace and conflict resolution, promote sustainability, which is very important for the discussion we're going to have, and of course to to promote and to advocate for uh, the principles inherent in the United Nations Charter. Now, what do we do? Well, first and foremost, we promote what you do, what every single member of ours do. Um, we promote the teaching innovation and methodologies, the research outputs and the strategies and the various community engagement activities of our universities and colleges whenever they inform us about uh, these issues. We also disseminate information on calls for abstracts, inputs, papers, submissions, and academic events, such as conference, in addition to announcements about contests, fellowships, and scholarships. We also organize in-person, virtual, and hybrid events on global topics, including side events of large UN conferences um, with the participation of universities. And this is a, just a sample of the different events we have done in all six official languages of the UN, English, Spanish, French, Russian, Chinese, and Arabic, in addition to Portuguese. Um, we keep universities abreast of the latest developments of the UN and news that might be of interest to academia, including, of course, messages and campaigns coming from the UN system. Uh, so it's not only about the UN Secretariat here in New York, but the entire UN system. And we provide guidance to universities and colleges whenever they request us to do so. And we serve as a platform to advance global academic cooperation, to connect universities in one country with universities in another country, to foster intellectual social responsibility and to enhance collaboration between academia and the UN system. And then I say the entire UN system, actually, because we work very closely with the colleagues of ours in, in UNSCR, in UNICEF, the World Food Program, FAO, ITU, the International Criminal Court, the International Court of Justice, and, and, and many other entities of, within the UN system. Um, we have a multilingual website, which is in all six official languages. We've already 6,000 daily visits. We have a newsletter that I invite you to subscribe to via our website. Uh, um, we have a mailing list with all the contacts of uh, the member institutions of ours, and we have, of course, our social media presence, and I invite you to follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Now, concerning the SDGs in particular, we have done the SDGs workshops in December 2021. We have done 10 of those in English, French, Spanish, and Chinese, with over 4,000 people attending and covering different aspects of the SDGs. 
uh, from various perspectives and angles into consideration. We are doing these trainings. Actually, this is the training number 24, uh, the one we are doing, and this is a relatively new program that started in January this year. Um, over 600 people have participated in English and Spanish. Um, we are publishing next week, actually, some guidelines for the implementation of the SDGs on campus. This is we are launching that alongside UNESCO. And we finished, and it's already available on the website, a compilation of best practices of the implementation of the SDGs on campus. And I invite you to, to check it out um, uh, on the website of ours, um, whenever you have the chance. Now, before we talk about the SDGs, I believe it's important to talk about what sustainable development means, because some people might have preconceived ideas of what sustainable development entails as a concept, what do we understand as sustainable development and what is not sustainable development? And I say this because most people, I believe, tend to assume that sustainable development somehow is interconnected, strictly speaking, just with environmental or ecological issues. And of course, topics that are not within that um, realm um, are not part of the sustainable development discussion. Now, having said that, it is a false statement to assume that sustainable development is only about the environment, because actually sustainable development is more about us. It's about the, the humanity, as the concept clearly states. That's the first thing. The second thing is that there is no universally agreed definition of sustainable development that is legally enforceable. So there's no international treaty about sustainable development. And there's no um, you know, widely recognized concept that is universally applicable. Having said that, if you Google right now what sustainable development is, it's very likely that you will find a definition that is either a copy or is paraphrasing the one that you see on the screen. And this is the original concept, uh, definition, I would say. And this is coming from the report of the World Commission on Environment and Development, um, which is titled Our Common Future, and it's from 1987. So it's it has been some decades since this report was issued. And of course, the knowledge about the severe impact of human activities has evolved quite significantly since 1987. There's also true uh, that this was uh, published uh, towards the end of the Cold War. You might find some very indirect references to some ideological um, struggles that were prevalent during those times. And of course, this is prior to the Rio conference of 1992, which is considered a landmark uh, international gathering on sustainable development. Now, having said all that, again, if you Google the definition of sustainable development, this is what you're most likely going to find. Um, and this is just two lines of definitions. But if we if we examine very carefully the factors that are within this concept, it's actually much more complex than it seems. So let's let's let's take a look at the text as it is uh, in the report. This is in paragraph 27, if I'm not mistaken, of the report. It says humanity has the ability to make development sustainable to ensure, and here comes the definition, that it meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So we have at the very least three different elements in the definition. The first one is the, the generational aspect. And the second one is the needs. And the third one is the ability to meet. Um, we could actually talk about a fourth element, which is the compromise, but let, let's start with the first one. When we speak about the generational aspect, it means that we're talking about the responsibility and accountability that comes with our actions in the present, and how that is uh, impacting, affecting ourselves in future tense, but also those who are coming behind us or after us. The second element is a little bit more complicated, which is the needs. What do we understand as a need? Is there a list of needs? What can we understand as a need? So we could say that need is basically everything that we require um, for our life, for our subsistence, for our dignity, for our development. Um, and we can get a little bit deeper into that in a moment. Then we have the ability to meet, and this is where things get a little bit tricky. 
So we have the generational aspect, we have the needs, but also now if we face ourselves with the question, can we meet the needs? What are we doing is hampering will prevent me from meeting those needs. So that's the more critical aspect. I will say the core question that sustainable development asks you and ask us. Are you keeping the ability to meet those needs? And then I mentioned that the, the potential for a fourth element of the definition, which is the compromise. Compromise is basically the factor that will allow us to measure the actual impact. Or if you read it backwards, it will, it will allow us or enable us to see if we have the ability or not to meet the needs. Now, the report continues saying that sustainable development first requires meeting the basic needs of all and extending to all the opportunity to fulfill their aspirations for a better life. And here you see there's a slight difference between this line and the definition. And the most obvious difference is that in the definition itself, we're talking about needs, but here, we are no longer talking about needs. We're talking about basic needs. So it's narrowing the concept. Generally speaking, and again, there's no, you know, that fine list of what basic needs entail, but we could argue that we're talking about shelter, we're talking about food, we're talking about health, we're talking about education, at least elementary education. So the very basic needs that we need to survive, basically, electricity, water, and there are Two other things that are very interesting in this sentence. The first one is that it says once you have met the basic needs, that is not the end of the journey. So you don't have sustainable development just with meeting the basic needs. You have sustainable development as long as you also fulfill your aspirations for a better life. So that means that even if you have shelter, even if you have food, even if you have water, even if you have electricity, even if you have the most essential needs met, you also aspire to be uh, to be living a decent life, to have a good job, to have a good salary, to have good benefits, to enjoy life. So sustainable development is a more broader concept than just meeting the absolute essential basic needs. That's the first important thing of this sentence. But the second most important thing is that there's a very short word that appears twice in the sentence, which is all requires meeting the basic needs of all and extending to all the opportunity to, to fulfill the aspiration for a better life. And you will ask yourself, why this strong emphasis on the word all? Well, if you see what the United Nations is doing right now, and actually we have a phrase that we commonly use, which is leaving no one behind. So when we speak about sustainable development, a special due consideration must be paid to those who are minorities, marginalized, discriminated, excluded, or simply not taken into consideration. Those people who we never hear about or who, for, who are frequently forgotten, these people are to be included in any formulation of public policies that are to be sustainable. Hence why the very strong emphasis on the word all, because nobody can be excluded from sustainable development. Then it says, sustainable development can only be pursued if population size and growth are in harmony with the changing productive potential of the ecosystem. So of course, we, I believe some weeks ago, some months ago, actually, we reached the milestone of the 8 billion people on the planet. Now, I don't know if that, that grow in population is hand by hand with the so-called harmony uh, with the ecosystem, but it's something that we need to take, to take care of. I guess sustainable development is not a goal in itself, hence why the third phrase says, it's not a fixed state of harmony but rather a process of change. 
And what does this mean in practice? That nobody, no country, no organization, no company can say, we have achieved sustainable development, and this is the end of the journey. No, sustainable development is a process of change. It's not an, an end goal in itself. But this is very important to highlight, regardless of what we think about sustainable development, and regardless of what we do about sustainable development in the end, sustainable development must rest on political will. So policymakers, decision makers, those who are empowered to legislate and implement policies, they also have to be convinced that sustainable development is the is is the is the way we we you know we should go through. Then um, the report from 1987 continues saying widespread poverty is no longer inevitable. So I mentioned at the beginning of this part that many people assume the sustainable development is somehow an environmental concept, which is not. And actually there's a very strong focus on poverty which is why the number one sustainable development goal and the number one millennium development goal that predated the, the SDGs is precisely about poverty. If you eliminate poverty, if you address poverty, that's the very first fundamental step that you need to take in order to actually achieve sustainable development. It also says the report that a world in which poverty is endemic will always be prone to ecological and other catastrophes. And I always mention this. If you put the map of the world and you indicate where poverty is more uh, prevalent, it was more endemic, and you put about that a map of the world where you have more natural disasters, and you put about that a map of the world where political violence, instability, conflict are more prevalent, you will see that there are many similarities in those maps. And this is not a coincidence. Already, former Secretary General Kofi Annan in his report, In Larger Freedom, he said that there's a triangle, there's a correlation between the concepts of peace, development, and human rights. Whenever you don't have development, most likely human rights are not being respected. And there's, there's a very strong possibility that peace will be absent and will be replaced by conflict. This is why sustainable development is so important. When you are, are in this process of sustainable development, you reduce the odds of human rights being deprived, violated, restricted, and you also reduce the odds of armed conflict, violence, and political stability. The report continues saying that meeting essential needs requires not only a new era of economic growth for nations in which the majority are poor, but an assurance that those poor get their fair share of the resources required to sustain that growth. So sustainable development is not a, a Robin Hood kind of scenario in which you take money from the rich and give it to the poor. It's rather an inclusive process. And it's not a divorce from the increase in the GDP, the gross domestic product. A country can actually achieve a sustained economic growth, but also including the marginalized groups and those who are left behind in the benefits of such economic growth. And finally, such equity, says the report, will be aided by political systems that secure effective citizen participation in decision making. And this is very important. We mentioned before that we need political will, which is true, but also we need that the population has a more saying in whatever formulation of public policies do occur. Um, we need people to be empowered. We need people that actually can participate and their voices are properly heard, but those who take decisions by those who legislate and by those who implement policies that ultimately are affecting all of us. And I believe in this regard, the role of universities cannot be underestimated because in some cases, in some countries, 
universities do serve as vehicles to to channel um, uh, these um, connections that we can create between the society in general, in a broader sense, and those who are in power. And universities are can be a vehicle of communication between uh, both stakeholders. At this point, are there any questions or comments? Um, feel free to, to do them. Um, I think you're muted, uh, Professor Shulabi. Uh, uh, Omar, thank you for uh, uh, uh, presenting uh, your presentation. I am just wondering uh, what you talked and uh, what you presented is uh, uh, exactly in harmony. So uh, we are following the slide that uh, introduction to sustainable development. So is that uh, verified that you are talking about this now? Yes, yes. Okay, and, and you are you are going to uh, deal with about uh, 17 sustainable development uh, goals. Is that right? Yeah, but I, I I wanted first to go to sustainable development before we reach the sustainable development goals. Okay, okay, just yeah. to make sure. Okay, everything is going well. Thank you very yeah. much. <clears throat> so, if anyone has any questions or comments, by all means, feel free to do to do so, and I will do my best to to reply. Okay. Let me ask again, uh, do you do you have any questions, all the participants? Uh, please do not hesitate to ask uh, Mr. Omar. Uh, he is ready for us. And I am just wondering, uh, can you also uh, give some uh, examples, good examples for the university, like uh, the university in, in our country, and uh, which uh, part, especially our university, can be uh, participated uh, for example, our university is a, a university that agricultural uh, products with a high added values. So, and uh, we have clean energy and uh, uh, I mean solar cell and the solar plant. And we have uh, good examples, but we may not know which one uh, uh, we should be uh, actively participating during your presentation. I would be happy if you give some examples from all over the world about sure. the 17 uh, SDG or Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, this is my uh, wish. Thank you very much. Sure. So if there are no further questions or comments, I will proceed. So I hope that you now have a clear picture of what sustainable development means. So we can talk about the Millennium Development Goals and then the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, uh, the 17 goals. Um, so before the SDGs, the MDGs existed, uh, the Millennium Development Goals, and as you can see, there were eight, and they were very specific in terms of their their the areas of actions covered. And as I was mentioning before, the number one was precisely about poverty and reducing poverty. And, and, and social exclusion, they'll also cover primary education. And listen very carefully to my words, because you're going to see a, a very strong contrast with the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, because these uh, SDGs are much, much uh, wider in scope, but the MDGs were rather narrow in what the areas were trying to, to reach. Also promoting gender equality, uh, and empowering of women, reducing child mortality, improving maternal health, combating HIV, AIDS, and tuberculosis. And actually, this is actually what I, uh, important for what I was saying. There was a millennium development goal on environmental sustainability, meaning that sustainability in itself is not an environmental concept, but does have an environmental component. Um, and also, partnership for development, this idea that we need to collaborate and, and, and forge partnership with others to achieve the goals. Now, the Millennium Development Goals, I would say, were partially successful, and the United Nations and the international community learned quite a lot uh, from the Millennium Development Goals. But in 2015, the international community came together and said, we need to revamp 
the global efforts towards sustainable development. What I was saying from this report from 1987, many decades have passed since that report was issued, but still we have the same challenges or worst. We have the same problems or worst. And we have now the technology and we have the science and we have the data to back up better enhanced policies, solutions and measures. So in 2015, the international community said that we need to have a new framework. We need to have a new system that will enable us to, to, to really pave the way towards sustainable development. Hence, the international community agreed on a political statement that was adopted by consensus by the General Assembly of the UN again in 2015. And the result of, of that consensus is this that you see on the screen, the, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Now, of course, the first notable difference with the MDGs is that, of course, we are more than double the number of the goals that we previously had. That's the first difference. And the second difference is that we, of course, because of the increased number of goals, uh, but also if you read at least the titles of the different icons that you have on the screen, you will see that the areas covered as are much wider. Um, and just to give you one example, the issue of quality education, it doesn't say primary education. It, it's talking about every single piece every single level and every single format of education, elementary school, high school, university or tertiary education, vocational training, and so on and so forth. And this is just one example. So the idea is that we are trying to cover as many, as much field as possible and as many actions as feasible. Now, as I said, this is a political statement, a political declaration that was made in 2015. And they have a deadline, which is the year 2030, hence why this year precisely is the midpoint. And I was saying earlier, the situation doesn't look very promising based on, on, on, on the different um, uh, situations that the world has faced in the past three, four years. Now, I always say, and this might sound as a cliche, but it happens to be true, that in times of crisis, we also find times of opportunities. So perhaps after the pandemic and in the midst of the war in Ukraine, it is time for us to rethink the way we do things, to rethink the role that we believe we have, to rethink the way we assess and we evaluate actions. So this time of crisis is, again, a time to revisit who we are and what we do and how we do it. Um, and I believe some countries are already doing that and some stakeholders are also doing that. And it's important to acknowledge first and foremost that the primary responsibility for the achievement of these 17 sustainable development goals lies on the governments of member states of the United Nations, who, by the way, were the ones who adopted the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development in the first place. So when we speak about the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, it's the agenda of the international community towards sustainable development to be achieved by the year 2030, and it's composed of these 17 sustainable development goals that you see on the screen, which I believe uh, in many countries, I don't know if that's the case of yours, but in many countries, uh, these icons are widely known, and especially the SDGs wheels, it's, it's very well known by, by the populace and by the the people in general. Um, so I believe there has been also from the side of the UN and the support of member states, of course, a much robust uh, branding, of, uh, you know, uh, advocacy, I would say, outreach efforts. Uh, so we are communicating more about this. And with that, we have increased awareness, capacity building that will is somehow helping to make the case for the Sustainable Development Goals in general. Now, we don't have the time to go through specifics regarding each one of the 17, but of course I will just present some general uh, information 
uh, about each one of the 17. And of course, uh, I will invite you to, to, to, to research information and to connect. Actually, I'm going to share with Professor Shelley uh, after the, uh, the end of this training session. Uh, so much, some suggested with materials that, that might be of interest to you, and some of which are rather new um, uh, from this year, actually. And uh, actually, as we speak, <coughs> the UN is preparing the fourth year global report on the sustainable development goals. And that's going to be issued as per a meeting I had yesterday, actually, at 12.30 uh, noon today, which is four hours from now. And uh, this is a very critical document that I believe would also serve the discussion about the situation of the world regarding the sustainable development goals, but also the things that we need to do in order to go back to track, if I may say that. So again, the number one sustainable development goal is about poverty. Uh, and it says, let's end poverty everywhere for everyone. Now, if you if you go to the targets, and I'm going to speak a little bit later, about the targets and the indicators of the SDGs, it's not about eliminating poverty in absolute terms, because that might be considered a little bit uh, not feasible, uh, at least in the time we have ahead of us. But at the very least, eliminating extreme poverty, uh, which is the proportion of people living with under $1.25 per day. Uh, and surprisingly or not, uh, this uh, huge number of people around the world precisely living under extreme poverty, and with all the consequences that come with that. Which is why, if you remember what the 1987 report was saying, this is why I always like to start with that. It says widespread poverty is no longer inevitable. I believe the United Nations believes that poverty is not a given. Poverty is not something that it's simply going to be there forever and ever. There are actually policies, solutions that can be implemented in order to reduce uh, poverty, ultimately aspiring, of course, to eliminate poverty altogether. But at the very least, sustainable development goal number one goes against absolute or extreme poverty, which is the worst version of poverty, if I may say that. Then, of course, we have sustainable development goal number two, which is zero hunger and zero hunger, the, as the as the image suggests, it's time to rethink how we grow, share, and consume our food. So these are three different aspects, but also it's about the management of the food waste. It's also about the nutritional aspect of the food we consume. There's a lot of um, uh, connection here with how agricultural activities take place, with how the crops are, are, are happening, with the impact of climate change of crops um, and all related things. While we are here talking about these things, as, as it happened with the previous um, SDG, behind these uh, goals, which are of course related to policies, to uh, laws, to um, statistics, to, to financial resources and, all, and on, on many other aspects. In reality, and I always make the case for this, behind each sustainable development goals, we have thousands, if not millions of people. Let's use this as an example. While we are here talking about this, millions around the world have absolutely no clue what are they going to eat this evening or this afternoon. This is actually a reality. Thousands of children in the Sahel region, which is nowadays um, deeply impacted by some political instability in at least two of the countries that are part of the region, and this is relatively new development from weeks ago, um, in the Sahel region in Africa, dozens of thousands of, of children are in, in, in, there's a possibility of them dying because of hunger. So these are current challenging issues. These are not merely statistics, numbers that mean nothing. Behind each number, we have human beings. 
Behind sustainable development, we have the humanity. And behind each one of the SDGs, we have people who are suffering while waiting for these SDGs to actually be achieved. Then we have sustainable development goal number three, which is about good health and well-being. Now, uh, yes. Uh, dear Omar, uh, I am just wondering, uh, the university academic staff or the students or other members of the university, how can participate in terms of project or in terms of social activities, in terms of uh, social project? Uh, how can we involve, how can we be involved in no poverty and zero hunger? So far you have talked about these two uh, sustainable yeah. development. Yeah, well, so, once uh, I, once I, you know, cover all the 17, then we go into that that part of what what what universities can do. Okay. Um, so uh, when we talk about sustainable development goal number three, I believe most people did not pay that close of attention to this particular goal until the COVID-19 pandemic happened. Um, and uh, it is interesting to say the least that one of the targets and again, I'm going to speak what a target is in a moment. But one of the targets of this particular sustainable development goals, besides it's about vaccines, um, and the, the, the need to ensure that we have equity in the distribution of vaccines. And you might remember all the controversy that, that, that existed in some parts of the world regarding this particular topic in the first months of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I always put the example of the city of New York where I live. Um, while here in New York, some people were, uh, um, they have some hesit hesitancy to, to get vaccinated. So in order to encourage more vaccinations, there was a surplus of vaccines in the United States and people were being in, in, enticed to get vaccinated by in New York specifically, they were giving a hundred dollars in cash uh, for people to get vaccinated for the first time. They were giving out pizzas, beers, tickets to movie theaters, and so on. While that was happening in New York, in many countries in Africa, they were still waiting the first dose of the vaccine. And things were not very promising on that front. So it is shocking, to say the least, that while in some countries there was a surplus of vaccines and they didn't know what to do with the vaccines, in many countries they were still waiting the first doses. So, of course, this is just one of the targets of this cover in this sustainable development world number three, but it, it covers a very wide range of health-related issues, um, including the prevention of uh, um, communicable diseases. And we have seen that probably in connection with the pandemic itself, there are many diseases that were eradicated from many countries that are back, sadly, in, in many parts of the world. Um, and the image is self-explanatory in itself in, in the sense that it says that access to good healthcare is a human right. Actually, it's enshrined in the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. You have the right to a good health. And if you have the resources and you can pay your own private insurance and you have very access to very well-established medical facilities, perfect. But if you don't have those resources and if you don't have that insurance, then the government of the country where you are should provide that to you. Then we have quality education. I am not going to stop here that long because I'm going to use this SDG in particular to explain the targets and the indicators. But just to mention, as I said, when you saw the MDGs, you saw there was a, an MDG about primary education, just primary education. But here, SDG number four actually covers the widest range of education. And it says inclusive education is the foundation for improving life. So education in itself is a vehicle, is a tool for people to actually achieve development, to grow and to have a life in dignity. But again, I'm going to go into the details of this particular goal in a moment. Then we have gender equality uh, and the fact that 
need, women need to be protected from violence, they need to have the same rights, and they, they need to have the same possibilities and opportunities as men do. Then we have SDG number six, which is clean water and sanitation, um, basically ensure access to safe water and sanitation services for all. The latter in particular is one of the key aspects of the transmission of diseases, which is connected to SDG number three. Um, and it's still many, many, many, many thousands, million people around the world do not have access to us, to a bathroom or to clean, to drink clean water on a regular basis. And then they have to walk in some cases many, many kilometers per day just to get some water with a quality that is quite dubious. Of course, because we are fighting or, or um, addressing climate change, um, we have to rethink the type of energy we use and how we use it. Hence why the Sustainable Development Goal number seven is about precisely affordable and clean energy transition from or away from fossil fuels to cleaner forms of energy. Then we have, of course, and I mentioned this already in the report of 1987, economic growth in itself is not bad. Nobody is saying that. Nobody has ever said that. What we're saying is that economic growth has to be hand by hand with inclusivity. So people need jobs, well-paid jobs. The youth that are graduating from your university or any other university in Turkey or any part of the world, they, they, what is their main concern? What I'm going to do once I get my diploma? So the, the creation of youth um, employment of, of job opportunities for youth is actually addressing this particular goal and it's not any job, it's decent job with decent salary, with decent opportunities. Um, hence why the phrase at the bottom of the, of the image that says promote inclusive and sustainable economic growth. Then we have industry innovation and infrastructure. So not only the governments of all countries need to allocate funds for sustainable infrastructure, but also the private sector has a very prominent role in sustainable development, um, not, not only the goals, but sustainable development in general. And the science, the technology that we have right now, for instance, probably the most famous one that you have, you read about it every day, artificial intelligence, is not an evil in itself. It has some risks, but we can use that. We can use that and any other technology, any other scientific innovation, to have a more inclusive, sustainable world for all of us. Then we have the goal of uh, reducing inequalities, and this is precisely to the point, again, going back to the 1987 report. You, you remember I mentioned the word all that appears twice in one of the sentences, precisely that goes with that. Uh, this goal particularly goes to um, address the needs of the elderly, the children, the women, the migrants, the asylum seekers, the refugees, the, the peoples who are discriminated, those who are who have been indeed left behind, precisely to empower them, to make sure that public policies include them. Then we have sustainable cities and communities. We need greener cities. We need to el eliminate slums and create decent housing. We have to improve waste management. We have to improve recycling. We have to improve uh, the water management systems in, in the cities. So the cities are more livable than the cities that we have right now. And of course, where um, violence is not prevalent. Um, we also have sustainable development goal number 12, which is responsible consumption and production. Um, is as the image says, use natural resources efficiently and manage them sustainably. So it's about what do we eat, what do we buy, what do we consume in terms of goods and services, how these goods and services are created or provided, what do we do with them, what do we, how do we handle the management of, of the waste and so on and so forth. So it's not only about how do we consume, but how we produce as well. And the private sector, has a very strong interest in this, but I'm going to speak about that later. We have Sustainable Development Goal number 13, which is about climate action. Climate change is a fact. 
it's a scientific fact that nobody can deny at this point. And we are all suffering the consequences of climate change. So the question is, how do we address the challenges provoked by climate change? How do we increase resilience toward disasters caused by, by climate change? How do we make sure that we are complying with international regulations that have been recently adopted precisely to um, challenge the, the, the, the issues related to climate change? Then, of course, we have Sustainable Development Goals number 14 and 15. The 14 is about life below water and life, I'm sorry, um, life on land. So this is basically about the protection of biodiversity, both below water and on land. The pr protection of the, of, the, of the sea life, but also the protection of biodiversity in general and the forests and the jungles and, and how the human activities can indeed affect them and how we have to reshape the way we do things in order to, to ensure the conservation of the natural resources that we have in both spaces. Um, for me, the most complex sustainable development goal is probably this one, peace, justice, and strong institutions. And it is about fighting corruption, fighting bribery. This is about promoting human rights and fundamental freedoms. This is about ensuring access to justice for everybody increasing accountability, transparency in the government and public institutions in general, advocating for peace and conflict resolution, um, strengthening democracy, actually. And finally, probably one of the sustainable development goals that is least understood uh, or studied, uh, you might remember from the MDGs that the last one was also about partnerships. So this is a, a replication of that. So the fact that the number 17 uh, of all the SDGs is that is precisely because of this reason. Governments cannot do everything on their own. We need international global cooperation. We need to partner and to join efforts with other stakeholders. We need to work hand by hand with the private sector, with civil society, with academia, with the media, with the youth. We need to work with as many stakeholders as possible. The, war, the more we work together, not only domestically, but internationally, the more we're going to achieve the sustainable development goals. And this is particularly important in these days, not only because, as I said, we are in the midpoint, but also because, again, the situation just doesn't look very promising. Hence why the image uh, related to this particular goal sells strong partnership move the SDGs from commitments that member states assumed in 2015 to tangible actions with tangible and concrete results that ultimately benefit all of us. I will stop here for a moment. Um, now we saw all the 17 SDGs. Are there any questions or comments? Feel free to, to uh, open your mics or, or write on the chat box. Um, uh, for example, uh, for the uh, life uh, on land yes. uh, can we can we relate uh, that we have uh, planted many trees in our campus yeah so can we uh, relate these activity in uh, uh, life uh, on land uh, sustainable development uh, number 15 i guess yeah yeah uh, actually well as i said unfortunately we can we cannot go to the specifics of each goal because we don't have time and that will take a long time but to your point and your question, there is a target in SDG 15, which is about reforestation uh, efforts. So, of course, not only um, the the planting trees is not only um, correlated with this reforestation efforts uh, contained in the SDG 15, but also correlated with other SDGs uh, because it improves the quality of the air um, and, and there are many other benefits associated with, with, with that. 
And we have seen that many universities around the world are actually doing that, uh, that, that, that, that kind of, uh, or pursuing that kind of initiative of planting trees on campus and involving students in, in, in that um, sense. And actually the recovery of forests, the recovery of, of plants, it's at, the, it's at the heart of many other actions of the international community in terms of forest, not necessarily related to the SDGs, but to previous international uh, commitments that, that were made, which are also correlated with SDG 13, for instance, because you increase resilience to natural disaster by planting more trees. That's, that's a given fact. Um, and and you, reduce, you reduce the likelihood of natural disaster to occur if you have more, more, more trees and more plants. Um, because you, you halt somehow uh, erosion and other issues that are, that are contributing to, to climate change. Okay, and also I think all the uh, uh, sustainable development goal, uh, goals can be linked to the last one, which is partnership for the goals. Is that right? Yes, actually, I always say I'm not very popular with that opinion, but I always say the last goal is the more important goal because if you do, if you if you don't partner, if you don't collaborate, if you don't work together, it it's it's a fact that none of the other goals will be achieved. That's a fact. Um, and which is why I was mentioning at the beginning of my presentation that we're going, we're going to have the SDG summit in a few days from now. And you might think, well, you will only hear from presidents and prime ministers. No, you will also hear from the private sector, from academics, from scientists, from researchers, from NGOs, because to the point of this goal number 17, you need the voices and the actions of as many stakeholders as possible. Um, okay, so I will uh, continue with the presentation. Please go ahead. So I mentioned that I was going to use sustainable development goal number four just to explain uh, what the indicators and the targets are. So each one of the 17 sustainable development goals has a number of targets, specific targets. In some cases, we have four, five, or even more. Now, each target covers a specific area of action within that sustainable development goal. That's the first. Second, each one of the targets is associated with at least one or two indicators. So in this particular example, you have SDG 4, again, quality education, and target 4.1, which is the first target of SDG number four, is free primary and secondary education. How do you measure that? So in order to measure that, you have a specific a statistical indicator that was designed for such purpose. And in this particular case, the indicator is number four, 0.1, 0.1. So again, you have SDG number four. The first target of SDG number four is 4.1. And the indicator associated with that target is 4.1.1. So which is the indicator? It says here, proportion of children and young people in grade two or three at the end of primary education and then at the end of lower secondary education achieving at least a minimum proficiency level in reading and mathematics by sex. So then you have the, you have the concept of what that indicator entails and you have all of the data sources. Uh, of course, the national assessments, which are mentioned towards the end of that, are the primary source of information. So governments are the ones who are reporting to the UN Via, via their national statistics offices, departments, or institutes, which is the situation in practice uh, on the ground. So the proportion of children, I'm going to explain this in a very, very simple way. Supposedly you have 100% of children and young people. And if out of that, that 100%, you only have 5%, which is a, a, an extreme percentage, but just for the sake of the explanation, if only 
of children and young people are actually enrolled or have ended primary education, the logical conclusion of that is that the policies concerning education are simply not efficient in that country. So the higher the proportion of children and young people that are in this uh, in grades two or three or at the end or have completed primary education, then you can say the government or the country has, is actually achieving this particular um, target. I believe somebody raised their hand, uh, but I don't know if, if anyone has any questions on this. So let me go back to the basic explanation. Each one of the sustainable development goals has a number of targets. Each target has an indicator, one or two. And most of the indicators, I would say confidently 95% of them, are quantitative indicators or numerical indicators, meaning that what they're going to provide is a proportion, a percentage, a number, a, a figure that will enable us to know if the actions undertaken by the government are efficient or not. And it will enable us to see where are the gaps and where are the opportunities and where are the successes uh, coming from the public policies implemented to achieve that. Now, again, in the particular case of sustainable development goal number four, let's see all the targets and let's see all the indicators. So this is the full list of the targets about sustainable development goal number four. And there are specifically three that I would like to highlight because of the implications for you as a university. Target number 4.3 says, ensure equal access for all women and men, an affordable and quality technical, vocational, and tertiary education, including university. What does this mean? So if we see the indicator, it says participation rate of youth and adults in formal and non-formal education and training in the previous 12 months by sex. So what's the meaning of this? This is about the fact that higher education cannot be something for the elite, for instance. Higher education should be open for everybody. Let me pause this for a moment. Strictly speaking, most experts and most people assume that higher education is not, let me repeat that, is not part of the right to education. Because according to international law, right to education ends in secondary school, period. That's, that's the legal definition of the right to education. But when we read this, ensure equal access for all women and men to affordable and quality technical vocation and tertiary education, including university, is telling us that no, right to education also includes higher education. So everybody is entitled to go to a university. Everybody is entitled to get a university diploma. Also, if we take a look at number 4.5, eliminate gender disparities in education and ensure equal access to all levels, including, of course, universities, um, of education and vocational training. So I will ask your university, how many students, how many female students do you have, for instance? But I will, I will go even beyond that. Not only students, how many female professors do you have? How many female researchers do you have? How many Women are in the leadership of the university, so gender equality also goes into that. My personal favorite, the last one, 4.7. Ensure that all learners, and of course, this includes university students, acquire the knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development. Let me give you an example of that. When I was a professor at the university in my home country, I used to teach international human rights law, one of the courses I taught. And this was in law school. I'm not a lawyer, I'm an international relations major, uh, but I'm a, I am a specialist in international law and particularly human rights law. So I remember I used to complain a lot 
about this fact. If you were a student of that university, the only possible way in which you could learn something about human rights is that if you were a law student. So if you were by any chance a student studying uh, civil engineering, for instance, or accountancy, or literally anything else, you didn't learn anything about human rights. So I always ask people over there, does that mean that if you are an engineer, you don't have human rights? You don't care about human rights? Can you defend human rights? So this is a sad reality, I believe, in many countries that only in the school of law you learn something about human rights. And of course, human rights have a legal component, but, but human rights are not a legal issue. Uh, we all have human rights. We all need to protect them. We all need to respect them. We all need to enforce them. So let me use that as an example for this particular target. And let me go back to the, to the statement of the target. Ensure that all learners, and again, this includes university students, acquire the knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development. This means that it doesn't matter what you are studying or what they are teaching you. Each educational institution, including your university, has, or must, I would say, promote sustainable development across the entire university. And the indicator for that says extent to which Global citizenship, education, and education for sustainable development, including gender equality and human rights, are mainstreamed. So I don't know which are the programs that are taught in your university, but let's, regardless of what, what are those, every student should be entitled to receive at least the basic skills to learn about global citizenship, to learn about sustainable development, to learn about gender equality, and to learn about human rights. So you don't need to be a lawyer or you, you don't need to be the international relations major or to be studying journalism. Regardless uh, of what you're studying, you should receive basic skills about that. Uh, Omer, uh, yes. it is a good idea to present a elective course to teach uh, all these sustainable developments uh, to make uh, more uh, awareness uh, for yes. the, everybody. Yes, actually, actually uh, in most cases, most countries, actually, I don't know if that's the case of, of uh, Turkey, but I believe in most countries, including mine for sure, uh, changing academic programs is a very tedious process. It's very lengthy because it has to be approved by different layers of the teacher making, including the governments in some cases. So for, for many universities, Professor Shelley, the most, the easiest way is to include optional courses or elective courses on sustainable development. So this is an idea that has been widespread uh, and uh, it has been implemented in many, many universities across, around the world. And most of them have been very uh, attractive to students for one specific reason. Many private companies now want professionals who know about sustainable development because these companies want to be more sustainable, either because they really care about sustainable development or because they want to portray themselves uh, as more sustainable. And I remember, I, I always mention this, I travel, I travel a lot around the world. Um, and I traveled earlier this year to Germany and I was laughing all the way there and back because every single thing I paid or used had the sustainable label. Um, I flew the most sustainable airline. I had the most sustainable flight. I stayed in the most sustainable hotel. I must, I used the most sustainable transport. So sustainability, I don't know in your nation, if that is a thing, but in Germany, it is very popular that companies use sustainable as a label for branding, for communication, for public relations, because they assume, which I believe in the case of Germany happens to be true, the German consumer cares about these kind of things. So if a German consumer has in front of him or her two products who are identical, same price, 
but one of them has a sustainable label, the consumer will go to the sustainable one. So because of that reason, and we can talk hours and hours about that, uh, and there's a lot of greenwashing, as we call it in the UN, some companies that say, I am green, I am sustainable, but when you really go through, they are not sustainable and they are certainly not green. Uh, but it this, is a, it is some, a quality assurance certificate, right? <laughs> yes, yes. So it is very important for some companies that the recent graduates from universities, in addition to knowing what they must know, they also know how to make the company more sustainable. So this is also of interest for universities, I'm sorry, for university students uh, um, to, to, to learn, right? Um, so as I was saying, the several development goals, each one has targets. We are talking about 169 targets. Uh, we're talking about a total of 232 indicators, which is why we cannot see them all in this training session, but just to mention that, and we on the on the left hand side of the slide, you see the cover of a handbook that covers most of the targets and most of the indicators. Um, of the SDGs, this was designed and developed by the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, and I can share the link to that with you. Um, and the idea of this handbook is that it has an explanation, a very detailed explanation of each one of the indic most of the indicators for the targets of the SDGs that are particularly useful for um, um, the for researchers and the decision makers and and so on and so forth. Um, I am not particularly uh, a fan of some of the indicators, uh, but this, but I mean, I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not an esthetician myself, but I believe some of the indicators are a little bit um, too narrow and don't allow really to, to have a good picture of the situation. But, you know, uh, for instance, I always use the example of gender equality. The first target of the goal number five is about eliminating all forms of discrimination against women and girls. That's the target. Eliminating all forms of discrimination against women and girls. The indicator for that is not, is not a numerical indicator. It's a yes or no question. The question is, is there a legal framework or not? to eliminate the discrimination against women and girls? That's the question. So of course, if that's the question, there are two possible answers. Yes, no. Now, of course, if you go to this handbook, you will see a very lengthy explanation, but in the end, it's a yes or no question and a yes or no answer. So I am not an expert on women's studies, or gender studies, but I will confidently say from a human rights perspective that the sole existence of a legal framework in itself does not eliminate anything. It's a first step, but not the only step. So, but, but again, if I ask you, maybe some of you are experts on gender, how do you measure that you eliminated the discrimination against women and girls? How do you measure that? So that, that, those are very tricky questions that actually are applicable to many things here. Um, how do you ensure quality? And you, Professor Shelley, were mentioning the quality assurances. Even, even those are controversial in some aspects. How do you measure quality? Because quality might be perceived as a subjective um, idea or concept. So um, this is all to say that uh, the indicators of the SDGs are not bulletproof, are not perfect, but they're the ones that are currently being used by the international community. Um, are there any questions at this point? Uh, do we have any questions? Ezgi Kaya, Ramazan, Gürbüz, uh, there are many uh, professors uh, uh, participating to this meeting, but I am not sure whether they have a question or not. Uh, from time to time you announce, uh, I, I hope they will ask. Belkis, do you have any question? Uh, 
I don't have uh, any question. Thank you uh, for your explanations. Uh, there is a lot of goals and targets. Uh, we are going to uh, use, uh, I hope, these uh, goals for our academic uh, studies. Yeah. Yeah, Ezgi Kaya, pro, uh, Professor Ezgi Kaya, do you have any comments or questions? Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, I'm just listening and uh, I try to understand all of things. Professor Ramazan Gürbüz. Thank, thank you, sir. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Hanendaz uh, his, uh, for his uh, fruitful presentation. It was very clear. Uh, thank you very much indeed. And by the way, uh, uh, Mr. Omar is going to share this presentation and then I can share with you in our website. It, it is OK, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. OK, thank you. So I will I will continue uh, with the presentation. Um, so. I said uh, that the 2030 agenda is uh, was adopted by member states uh, of the UN, and as such, member states are the responsible for for achieving the SDGs and to report on such achievements. So the way they do that is through what we call the voluntary national reviews, and these are part of the follow up and review of the agenda. And they are voluntary, of course, as the name suggests, but also state led. So the governments of each state are the ones in charge of doing these reviews or assessments or evaluations. And they are undertaken by both developed and developing countries and provide a platform for partnerships, including with universities. Um, and there, what's the what's the goal of these reviews? Basically to track progress. Um, and the principles that guide the examinations at all levels establish that they will be substantive and based on knowledge as well as open, inclusive, participatory, and transparent. And I mentioned universities because in many countries, universities participate directly in the, in the drafting of these reports, of these reviews, if they because they they they uh, ask the government to be included or the government make a call to universities to be added to the reviews. Whatever the case is, in many countries, that's actually the case. Um, so, of course, there, there is a, a, a question here about transparency, which is why it is included as one of the guidelines that the United Nations through this handbook that you see the cover on the left hand side suggests that these reviews, although they are state led, they need to be transparent. And let me use something as an example. We have in the human rights sphere something called the Universal Periodic Review of Human Rights. That happens in Geneva, uh, in the UN over there. Uh, in the within the framework of the Human Rights Council. Whenever a country undergoes a universal periodic review, you have three reports. The report made by the government, the report made by the UN, and the report made by the UN with information from NGOs. So you have three reports. The civil society one, the UN one, and the government one. So because you have those three reports, you, have, you can do a very... I would say comprehensive review of the situation in the country. And in some cases, you will see, if I may say that, very conflicting views between the three reports that to, to, to, to the point that it seems that we're talking about three different countries. And you, you may ask yourself why. Well, the, the reason is very logical. I don't think any country in the world, we're talking about the Universal Periodic Review, any country in the world will say openly, of course, I violate human rights. Of course, I don't respect any human rights international treaty. Of course, I don't care about human rights. It's very unlikely that a country will say that. So all countries want to portray themselves in the best picture possible, which is why when you have the other two reports from the NGO community, 
and from the UN. Why I mentioned that example? Because in this, in this case, with the 17 SDGs, the voluntary national reviews are not like that. We only have one report, and that one report is made by the government of the country, which is why the UN encourages that because of that situation, in the drafting, in the elaboration of these reviews, the process needs to be open, inclusive, participatory and transparent. So not only governmental officials are drafting it, but also people from academia, for instance, are included in the drafting. So the UN recently launched, by recently I mean July this year actually, the, the 2023 uh, SDGs report. And this is just one excerpt from that about SDG4 in particular. These are some of the conclusions. Uh, from the July 2023 report. The world is falling far behind in achieving quality education. The pandemic learning losses in four in five of 104 countries studied. Primary and secondary school completion rates are rising, but the pace is low and uneven. Low and lower middle income countries face a nearly 100 billion annual financing gap to reach their educational or education targets. So at least based on these conclusions, the situation about specifically SDG4 is not very good, doesn't seem very good. But this is the time of information that we need to correct path, to, to rethink, as I already mentioned, the policies that we have in front of us, to, to, to revisit the way in which we do things. Now, to your question, Professor Shelley, uh, which is a very pertinent question. So what's, what's the role of universities in all that? Let me start with the message from our current Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, to the International Association of University Presidents for the Triennial Conference in 2021. He said, and let me go to the second paragraph of that message. We call on universities through your teaching research and innovation to continue to make a profound contribution to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So the leadership of the UN is already aware of a quote, profound contribution that universities do to the SDGs. Then uh, last year, uh, our Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed, uh, in a meeting said, universities are places that nurture incubation, exchange, innovation, and interdisciplinary analysis setting the pathway to change. I'm particularly struck by these words of incubation because if, if universities are to be anything, precisely is to generate solutions. Now, it is important to acknowledge that in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, as I already mentioned, there are two specific references to academia. The first reference is governments and public institutions will also work closely on implementation with a number of stakeholders, including academia. And then it says our journey will involve governments as well as parliaments and so on and so forth, including the scientific an academic community. Now, if we quickly read some of the targets of all the SDGs, you will find a lot of references to universities, research, science, and technology. Um, research happens where? in universities, where science happens, in universities, where technology is developed, in universities. So indirectly or not, universities are at the core of many of the targets of the SDGs. We have the example of target 2.8 um, on zero hunger, which is about agricultural research. We have target 3.B uh, on good health and well-being, 
and it's about the research of vaccines and medicines. We have already, as we already saw, the inclusion of university in target 4.3 of quality education goal uh, number four. We also have the gender issue. We also have the sustainable development issue uh, for which are targets 4.5 and 4.7, also SDG4. Um, then we have on goal seven, energy research, clean energy research in particular, concerning SDG 9, we have 9.5 and 9.B on scientific research. Um, we also have um, in SDG 12, uh, the scientific and technological capacity of developing countries, which of course includes the one in universities. SDG 4 makes a lot of references to research and scientific cooperation, science-based management plans. This is about life below water scientific information, scientific knowledge, research capacity. And finally, the SDG number 17 in the target number 17.6 says that open science needs to be a fact. And actually that's something that our colleagues in the Dahamashko Library uh, here in the UN are advocating a lot for. The, the, the need to have that science is not to be restricted to the hands of a few, but science should be open to everybody. And hence, and here particularly, the role of university is, is critically important. Now, what are some of the actions universities can do and are already doing about the SDGs? First, you cannot lead in any other way by, but by example. So you cannot tell others to be more sustainable if you are not sustainable yourself as an institution. So the first thing is that you need to implement sustainable policies on campus. Many universities are creating awareness, both of campus and beyond. They are mobilizing students for action. They are educating and providing training to external audiences. They're collecting data. They're conducting research analyzing information, drafting legislation, providing policy advice, engaging with the community and the private sector, and as Amina Mohammed, our deputy SG said, incubating ideas and solutions. Mm -hmm. Very good. Then what are some of the things universities can do about the SDGs? And this is um, actually further explained in the guidelines that we're going to launch next week uh, with uh, UNESCO. Uh, at some point this week, we have an event on Monday and hopefully uh, uh, shortly after that, we are going to uh, uh, publish it on the website of ours. First of all, it will help the case if the university creates a conceptual framework or an strategy of sustainability that something that can guide the entire university towards sustainable development. Also, to design a system to map, to align existing academic courses and programs as well as research projects with the SDGs. If you do that, it's very likely that you are already teaching a lot concerning sustainable development, and you're already researching a lot about sustainable development. And the third guideline, this is particularly important if the university is, is rather large, which is, I am not, this the case of Georgia University, but uh, the larger the university, the more important this particular guideline is, is to establish a strategic coordination procedure across the university and a mechanism for monitoring and sharing best practices. I mentioned briefly, though, that most of the indicators are quantitative indicators, numerical indicators, but you might want to leave space to have more um, um, quantitative information and data. Uh, and to, you are entitled to create your own indicators, right? And you should keep a record of everything concerning the incorporation of the SDGs into the university practice, mainstreaming the SDGs into the what the university does. 
Now, the three core areas of action by universities offer possibilities and opportunities concerning the SDGs. If you were to review what do you do on the SDGs, these are basic steps you can do. First, in terms of teaching, how at the undergraduate and graduate levels, as well as extension courses and professional development initiatives, are the SDGs mainstream and incorporated into academic programs, curricular modules, pedagogical strategies, study guides, and activities with students of experiential or empirical nature. This is just about teaching. If you go to research, how are the SDGs connected to projects either completed or in progress in centers, schools, groups, institutes, and labs of the university with measurable and tangible results? Of course, many of you who teach also write and publish. So we're talking about scientific publications and how SDGs are connected with articles in peer review, scholarly journals, book chapters, books, working documents, memorials, and others. And we are only talking about, uh, um, we are not only talking about the research conducted by faculty and scientists, but also by students. So how the SDGs are connected with dissertations and or thesis, as well as projects of less scientific or methodological rigor uh, developed by students. And finally, what the university does on community engagement. How are the SDGs connected to concluded or ongoing projects developed by the union of the university in partnership or together with relevant stakeholders such as youth movements, NGOs, foundations, churches, religious groups, governments at all levels for the benefit or to address, meet or resolve particular or specific needs of vulnerable groups, a sector of the community, um, the community in a broader sense or the population in general. So even either if you're studying, teaching, researching and working, you have a voice. And I ask you, what would you do next? Again, to have a, a healthier, a more inclusive world for all of us and to make the sustainable development goals a reality. And I thank you very much indeed for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Omar. Uh, uh, you have uh, presented very comprehensive uh, presentation about the uh, uh, 17 sustainable development goals. Uh, you covered an introduction to sustainable development and the role of academia in advancing 2030 or 2030 agenda. Basics uh, about the SDGs and the presentation and the definition, etc and ideas to implement the SDGs on campus and beyond, and potential review mechanism, and uh, some idea from the United Nations Secretary General and uh, some others about the roles of the universities uh, to make more, uh, to, to increase the awareness about SDGs. So therefore, uh, it was very impressive and very beneficial uh, speech. And I was, uh, I, I, I am, uh, I am very happy to to uh, listen to you, and I would be uh, very grateful uh, if you sent the uh, PowerPoint presentation for the others' benefit. And also, I would like to express uh, our gratitude on behalf of our university uh, to you. And also, I am uh, very uh, grateful to the participants, some deans and some uh, coordinators of quality assurance and some other professors uh, have attended and uh, listened carefully. Therefore, it was very uh, nice and uh, beneficial and productive uh, program. So uh, as a last announcement, is there anybody who uh, has a questions or comments or additional uh, comments, uh, it would be very useful. For example, uh, Dean of the uh, one of the faculty, Professor Senai Dönmez is uh, also uh, here as a participant. Do we have any uh, questions or comments, uh, Professor Senai Dönmez or uh, any other professors? This is the last announcement before closing the program. Uh, one of the professor asked a question in chat, I guess. 
can you see the chat? Uh, yeah, yes. Um, Olga Ergül uh, send a message. I don't know. Can you hear, see it? Um, actually, yes. Uh, I mean, any, you know, there's no predefined set of things universities can do, uh, but uh, we have a saying in Spanish that says aterrizar algo, meaning landing something. So the SDGs are like here in the air, whatever way you can find to use the resources that you have, the courses that you teach, the things that you research, whatever way you can find to connect or to liaise that with the SDGs is the correct way. There's no there's no good or bad. There's, all the ideas are good as long as it allows you and enables you to, to promote sustainable development. And this in this particular case, for it, and I'm thinking global citizenship, for, for example, um, to to the whatever resources do you have to in this particular case to promote the local culture um, actually goes directly to SDG number four on quality education. Uh, quality education is a, is a very wide and open concept. And, and, and the fact that you can include regional and local aspects of it is wonderful. So if you can use that, uh, um, this is actually a concrete, a very concrete example of how um, you can teach about sustainable development by being sustainable in the actual way of teaching. Um, so again, there is no absolute list of, uh, of, of activities that you can do. But anything that you can think of to to help to advance the SDGs is going to be a positive gain for for, for all. Um, so thank you for that comment. Um, and again, if you have any other thing, uh, my email, which appears towards the end of the presentation, uh, uh, is my name Omar dot Hernandez at un.org. So it's very easily. Um, to to follow. So if any one of you or you want to do that via a Professor Shelby, uh, my office and myself, we are we are happy to to share our thoughts and ideas with you, and to provide guidance if if so requested. And I'm, I'm, uh, shortly I will send the the slides to you and some other links to suggested materials for reading that you might be interested of that are as I said relatively new and then that, that might be. Um, useful for you and, and to learn a little bit more about sustainable development. Okay, is there any other questions and comment? Uh, sorry, uh, may I ask a question? Uh, yeah. This is Belkis Mujahid. Uh, you mentioned uh, 17 goals, uh, but uh, how we learn uh, sub goals uh, from this handbook or uh, from your website? Um, so as I mentioned, because of the of the time we had for this session, it will be very lengthy explanation to go through the specifics of each one of the goals. But I will in the materials I'm going to send. You will find the specificities of each one of the goals, including the the the information about the all the all the 169 targets and the 232 indicators. So the information will be there in case you are interested in going deeper uh, about that. And if your university has a specific interest in one specific goal, um, you know I can connect you with experts on, on those issues because, of course, I'm not an expert on on most of the things that are covered by the Sustainable Development Goals, but uh, I do know people in FAO, ITU, uh, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, UNSCR, et cetera, that, that can provide more advanced information or details about specific goals within their areas of, of, of mandate. OK, thank you. And thank you, sir. Pat Kurtolo raised uh, his hand. Uh, please go ahead. OK, Mr. Hernandez, thank you so much uh, for this uh, presentation. My name is Ahmed from Civil Engineering Department, and I see one of the goals in uh, uh, your report, goal number 11, Sustainable Cities and Communities, and also the other goals uh, 
I think they are all based on the problems uh, uh, in this planet. So you must have had some research and uh, you must have some data. Do you provide uh, a, uh, like a, a database? Uh, do you have a platform uh, that you can uh, that we can access as academics and use in in our research? Yes. Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, yes, there are multiple databases that I will share the links uh, with Professor Shelley uh, for wider the dissemination. But I must confess that the UN is sometimes a little bit um, tricky to find information for researchers because mostly the reason is that the information is spread through different databases and sometimes the access is not very easy or you need to have to be part of the UN to access that. We are improving that and we have a lot of people improving those those uh, databases and access to information. Um, but I'm going to share the links I have to the databases that I know uh, are widely used by university researchers and I'm, I, I hope that, that that will be useful. Having said that, if yourself or uh, researchers uh, or another researcher from the university has a specific question on specific things, that's something we do. I connect you with people in charge of that or people who handle that information directly so you can communicate directly on that specific issue. But in, in principle, I hope the databases I will share will be useful. But if again, if you have a specific questions, do not hesitate to ask me and I can I can I can point into the right direction. Um, for instance, let's say you are you want something very specific about cropping, uh, about food, about food in the mountains of Uzbekistan, for instance. So I can put you in touch with somebody who can provide the information specifically for that. OK, thank you so much. OK, any other uh, questions or comments? Uh, let me see. From WhatsApp. OK, there is no other comment. OK, uh, uh, uh, if there is no other questions and comment, uh, again, I would like to thank you, uh, uh, Omar, and uh, it was a privilege uh, uh, for us uh, to listen to you and uh, watch your presentation. It was very productive and beneficial and fruitful speech and comprehensive speech to cover the many uh, aspects of 17 uh, sustainable development goals. So we will keep in touch and I will share the documents, uh, uh, Professor, I, I will share the documents, uh, Omar uh, uh, will share me with me or send me by email and I will share you all the participants. And uh, again, uh, it was really good. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. all the participants also uh, because they listened carefully about uh, two hours uh, these uh, fruitful uh, presentation and uh, I think uh, that's all. Uh, yes. uh, this if you don't have any final comment uh, Omar uh, we can close. Uh, yes uh, well uh, on behalf of the United Nations Academic Impact, Esekur uh, Ederim from, from New York, and I wish you a nice rest of the day. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Mm -hmm. See you in the other occasion. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I think uh, Omar has. Uh, left the uh, meeting is that o zaman biraz Türkçe bir açıklama yapabiliriz. Evet. Arkadaşlar hepinize teşekkür ediyorum. E, sabırla dinlediniz. E, bu katılımcı sayısı da iyiydi. Daha fazla da olabilirdi ama en azından 33 35 falan oldu sanıyorum. E, güzeldi. E, rektörümüz müsait değildi. Ben e, Vedat Bey'e sordum. Ee, başka bir programda imiş. O yüzden onu da kısa bir konuşmayla programa dahil etmek istedim. Fakat müsait değildi. Yani e, özet olarak bu e, 17 e, 
Sustainable Development Goals Türkçe'ye de tercüme edecek olursak e, Sustainable sürdürülebilir biliyorsunuz. Sürdürülebilir kalkınma hedefleri veya amaçları diye tercüme edebiliriz. Bu önemli. Birleşmiş Milletler'in hem gündeminde hem e, TÜBİTAK'ı TÜBİTAK projelerde e, bu projeniz e, bu 17 gücilerden e, hangisiyle ilgili? Evet. Evet, şey Ramazan Bey sesiniz açık. Pardon hocam sadece, teşekkürler hocam. Hocam sadece TÜBİTAK projelerini evet. ilişkilendirebiliyoruz. Ee, dolayısıyla bu 17 e, sürdürülebilir kalkınma hedefleri e, Cumhurbaşkanlığı Strateji Daire Başkanlığı tarafından da gündemde. Tüm dünyanın gündeminde olduğu için biz de üniversite olarak bu farkındalığı artırmak, bu alanda proje yapmak, hem e, e, araştırma projesi tarzında, hem üniversitemizin e, sosyal projeleri tarzında, hem e, bu farkındalığı artırarak e, ulusal veya uluslararası ilişkiler e, işbirliği tarzında, bu 17 e, sürdürülebilir kalkınma hedeflerini e, daha iyi anlamak, daha iyi hayata geçirmek, daha e, çok proje yapmak, e, daha çok üniversitemizin adını duyurmak, daha çok e, topluma hizmet etmek tarzında böyle bir hedefimizi e, başlangıç olarak gerçekleştirmiş olduk. E, Belkıs Hanım'a teşekkür ediyoruz. E, teknik şeyleri takip etti, sizinle e, sürekli iletişim kurdu. efendim. E, Ömer de sağ olsun bizi kabul etti ve e, iki saate yakın zamanını ayırdı. Ee, bu, bu arada bizim e, UN e, AI diye kısaltılan United Nation, Nations Academic Impact bu e, şey e, e, organizasyonun şeyi bu program menajeri e, tanıtmayı kendisi yaptı ama ben bir altını çizeyim program manager of the United Nations Academic Impact diye bir konumu var bu bu tarz aktiviteleri organize ediyor. Biz de Türkiye'de e, 7 veya 8 tane üniversite üye. Onlardan birisi de bizim Iğdır Üniversitesi. Bu da üniversitemiz için bir ayrıcalık. E, Birleşmiş Milletler'in böyle bir aktivitesinde biz de e, bir şey olarak, paydaş olarak e, rol almış olduk. Bunu e, üniversitemizin web sayfasında e, gözden geçirdikten sonra e, post yapabiliriz, ilan edebiliriz, izleyenler olur veya e, Omar'ın göndereceği efendim e, e, PowerPoint presentation olur, başka doküman olur olursa onu ben paylaşacağım. E, dolayısıyla e, güzel bir program oldu diye düşünüyorum. Sizlerin de kısaca Türkçe yorumlarınızı alıp kapatabiliriz. Hocam ben bir şey sormak istiyorum hani e, grupta da paylaşmıştım ya kişilerin e, yani akademisyenlerin web sayfalarında bu e, Omar'ın bahsettiği e, başlıkların ikonlarını gördüm e, paylaşmıştım da hani bizim de bu şekilde kullanma imkanımız olacak mı bundan biz nasıl faydalanacağız şimdi birçok hocamız özelde soruyor. Hani bunu dinledik tamam bu 17 sürdürülebilir kalkınma hedefini e, öğrendik ama bu bizim ne işimize yarayacak? Biz bunu nasıl ilişkilendireceğiz çalışmalarımızla? Hani bunu aslında biraz daha açabilirseniz çok güzel olur. Zaten bu bir başlangıç e, Belkıs Hanım. E, dolayısıyla şeyin başında bu programın başında dikkat ederseniz çoğu kimse nedir bu 17 SDG falan derken şimdi herkes... E, konuya vakıf oldu bir derece. Farkındalık oluştu. Artı ben e, bizzat geçen bir iki ay önce bir e, 22.09'da e, şeydim, e, panelistim iki projede. E, orada e, sorulardan şey e, değerlendirmeden sonra bu proje e, 17 sürdürülebilir kalkınma amaçları ve hedeflerinden hangisiyle ilişkilidir gibi sorular da soruyor. Belli ki onun da orada bir yansıması TÜBİTAK'ta kabul edilme bağlamında oluyordur. Dolayısıyla ileride bu e, üniversitelerin nasıl ki ISO 9001 belgemiz var diye biz e, övünüyoruz, aldık diyoruz. Başkaları şu şu e, kalite güvencesi belgemiz var diyor. Filan akreditasyonda e, akredi, filan yerden akredite olduk diyor falan. Bunlar bir üniversite için kalite göstergesi, indikatör dediğimiz şey oluyor. 
bu e, 17 sürdürülebilir kalkınma hedeflerinde de akademisyenlerin meşguliyeti, onunla ilgili proje yapması, onlarla ilgili e, sunum veya konferanslarda bulunması vesaire işbirliğinde bulunması ileride daha e, öne çıkacak diye düşünüyorum. Bu bir başlangıç. Zaman içerisinde hep beraber göreceğiz neler yapabiliriz ve bunu nereye taşıyabiliriz. Dolayısıyla e, bir başlangıç olarak e, iyi oldu. Ama e, bütün sorulara <gülüyor> iki saatlik toplantıdan sonra cevap vermek de mümkün değil. Biz de bu işin içerisine bu vesileyle girmiş olduk. E, dolayısıyla mesela e, ben ona sordum. E, bu e, 17 sürdürülebilir kalkınma hedeflerinin biraz da ayrıntısını vererek seçmeli bir ders olabilme fikri nasıl diye iyi olur falan diye onayladı siz de duymuşsunuzdur. Dolayısıyla Hı-hı. bir ders açılabilir. Kendini yetiştiren birisi o dersi vererekten farkındalığı artırabilir. Öğrencilere bu farkındalık artırınca onlar proje yapmak isteyecektir. Bu 17'nin içerisinde herkesi ilgilendiren herkesin bir şeyler yapması gereken e, şeyler var efendim aktiviteler var dolayısıyla araştırmanın e, öğrenciliğin öğretmenin research e, veya industry e, teaching e, learning diye sıraladı ya onların her birisinin bununla ilişkisi var e, başka üniversiteler dünya çapındaki üniversitelerden de örnekler var bu site biraz incelenirse onlar görülebilir fikir edinebilir bizler neler, neler yapabiliriz diye. Mesela bizi üniversitemizi tanıtan bir İngilizce şey olmasını arzu ettim ama tam istediğim düzeyde olmadığı için şey yapmak istemedim. İleride böyle üç dakikada en etkin bir şekilde üniversitemizi tanıtan biraz daha İngilizce pronunciation'ı iyi olan bir risi tarafından seslendirilen bir şey hazırlanabilir, video hazırlanabilir. Yani çeşitli etkinlikler yapılabilir. Sizden de gelen fikirlerle olgunlaştırılabilir ama şu aşamada e, e, program amacına ulaştı, farkındalık kısmen oluştu. Bundan sonra neler yapılabiliriz'i hep beraber göreceğiz inşallah. Katkıları verenlere teşekkür edeceğiz. E, bu arada sizin katılımınız başlangıç itibariyle önemli bir e, şeydi, ne katkıydı. E, başka sormak istediğiniz bir şey varsa. E, ilave edeyim. Veya sizin kendiniz ilave edeceğiniz yorumlarınız varsa İngilizce e, dinledim ama konuşurken belki yetersiz kalırım da diye söz almadım ama Türkçe önemli olan fikirlerimi paylaşmak istiyorum dediğiniz varsa e, Türkçe paylaşın. Onu e, bir şekilde değerlendiririz. Değerlendirilir. E, e, hocam. Buyur. Sesim geliyor mu? Ha. Geliyor. Eşitmelerde İşletmelerde sürdürülebilirlik diye yüksek lisansta zaten bir ders seçmeli dersimiz var bizim. Ee, öyle bir Sür- dersimiz var. Sürdürülebilir- Ama işletmelere yönelik, yönelik sürdürülebilirlik nasıl oluyor? Ee, Ayaz Yusuf, o sürdürülebilirlik, e, sustainable, sustainable enerji, renewable enerji orada da geçer ama bu 17 e, sustainable development goals diye ifade edilen teker teker de açıklanan şeyleri Bunların hepsini şey yapıyoruz biz görüyoruz yani en azından o şey kısım var yani sürdürülebilirlik tarihçesini ele aldığımız zaman şey yapıyoruz söylüyorum ben derslerde ha, o, o güzel bir şey o zaman e, o güzel bir şey ama e, özellikle de bu e, şeyi e, baz alaraktan e, 17 e, hedefi ve amacı baz alaraktan bir seçmeli derste açılabilir diye benim aklıma Tabii. geldi. Ee, sizinkinin kapsamı bunu dolduruyorsa o dersi e, adını bu manada güncelleyip herkese duyurabiliriz. Başka birimlerden, bölümlerden de e, bu dersi Hı-hı. seçmeli olarak alabilirler. Yani e, herhangi bir bu konuda hazır hocamız yeni bir ders de açabilir. Sizin dersiniz de güncellenebilir diye düşünüyorum. Başka... E, Başka... Bir de bir de mesela biz yüksek sansta dönem projesi olarak bu e, seracılık konusunda jeotermal seracılık diye bir tane çalışma yapmıştık. Hı hı. E, onu da kitaplaştırdık zaten. 
E, mesela onunla ilgili ne bileyim işte bir çevresinde var Iğdır'ın. Iğdır'dan iyi olmasın. Yani bunun e, olabileceğine dair e, kanıtlar ortaya koyduk. E, ya yani işletme açısından yatırım e, planlamasını çıkardık. Yani çalışmalar vardı hocam. Mesela bunları biz e, bu şeyle nasıl ilişkilendireceğiz yani? Gelip mesela bize e, yayın e, açısından şey sağlayacaklar mı mesela? Ya da ne bileyim e, bunlar e, bunlara ilişkin gerçekleştirebilmek için fon sağlayabileceğiz mi? Projeye yatırım dönüştürebilecek miyiz yani? Ya işte bu bunlar... Cumhurbaşkanlığı stratejik şeylerinde, hedeflerinde de bu gündeme oturduğu için Birleşmiş Milletler'in üyesi olmamız hasebiyle. Bu neticede tüm Türkiye'nin çeşitli kademelerde yapacağı bir faaliyet olacak. Biz de üniversite olarak bu konuda bir farkındalık oluşturmuş olduk. Nedir, ne değildir? Bunu daha iyi nasıl anlarız, nasıl proje yaparız, nasıl geliştiririz diye. Dolayısıyla devamını e, e, ara sıra toplantı yaparak e, artırabiliriz. E, o konuda şimdilik bunları söyleyebilirim. Ama e, başka yorumu veya sorusu olan varsa onlara da söz hakkı verebiliriz. Zaten bu İngilizce bir şeydi. E, kendisi de genel sunum yaptı. Böyle özele girip de e, benim örnekler verebilir misiniz diye sormuştum mesela filan üniversite dünyanın filan üniversitesinde filan numaralı SDG'ye şöyle bir örnek yapıldı biz de onu beğendik Şu sitemizde şöyle bunu haber yaptık falan diye örnekler vermesini de bekledim ama genel genel gitti ee, ama bu bir başlangıç biraz da biz eşeleyeceğiz bilgiye ulaşacağız Fikir üreteceğiz, beyin cimnastiği yapacağız vesaire ee, oluşturacağız. Incubation dedi ya kuluçka manasında. Hı hı. Ee, dolayısıyla e, bir, bir anda bir şey olmuyor. Bir ağaç bir anda meyve vermiyor malum. Önce çekirdeği ekiyorsun, ekiyorsun. E, sonra e, zamanı gelince akımını yaptığında meyvesini alıyorsun. Biz de o manada bir başlangıç yapmış olduk. İyi oldu bence e, üniversitemiz adına. Ee, i̇nşallah geliştireceğiz. Başka? Sevtap Tırınk bir şey mi demek istedi demin? Bilmiyorum. Hocamızın bir dersi varmış hocam. Ee, sürdürülebilir e, lisansüstü dersi varmış. Bi Biyomühendislikte sürdürülebilir mühendislik adında bir ders veriyormuş. Ee, benim de yine böyle Türkiye bitki örtüsü ve sürdürülebilir kalkınma ilişkisiyle ilgili bir dersim vardı lisans üstünde. Yani bu tip konuda lisans üstünde ele alıyoruz ama herhalde ön lisans ve lisans için de e, bu konular düşünülebilir dediğiniz gibi eğer 2209'larda e, bu tip e, sorguları yapıyorlarsa özellikle işte hani TÜBİTAN son zamanlarda değerlendirdiği bu e, yeşil mütabakat olayı var biliyorsunuz. Ee, yeşil mütabakata uygun olarak yazılmış olan e, projelere artı puan veriyor TÜBİTAK. Bu ister öğrenci projesi olsun ister e, 1001 1002 gibi projeler olsun. E, işte öncelikli alanlar ya da işte yeşil mütabakat kapsamında Avrupa Birliği'ne uyum e, çerçevesinde e, bu tip konulara önem veriliyor. E, bunlar dediğim gibi yani lisans ön lisans derslerinde de ele alınabilir dediğiniz gibi belki bir seçmeli derste gündeme getirilebilir. Yani şeyini 14 haftaya sığdıracak şekilde bu şeyin ne zaman hangi tarihte başladı, filan tarihte ne hale geldi, sonra nasıl geliştirildi, sonra nasıl yaygınlaştırıldı bunların teker teker tarihleri var. Filan şehirdeki toplantıda şu karar alındı. Sonra bu geliştirildi. Sonra bu 17'ye çıkarıldı falan. Bunun bir tarihçesi bile var yani. Dolayısıyla bunlardan bahseden, her birini biraz daha açan, onların içinde target dedikleri e, ayrıntılı hedefleri e, de sıralayan, örnekleri e, değişik üniversitelerden, uluslararası e, üniversitelerden örnekler vererek, mesela e, and hunger mıydı veya no poverty mıydı öyle bir şeyden başlayıp, e, partnership'ten tut e, 
sağlıkla ilgili bilmem 17'sinin hepsini az önce sıraladı. Bizde de e, grubumuzda paylaştık. Onlardan e, her birini biraz daha açarak örnek uygulamalar sunarak e, bu hedefe uygun akademik bir ders içeriği hazırlanırsa seçmeli ders olarak ben şahsen senatoda desteklerim. Güzel de olur diye düşünüyorum. E, sizin söyledikleriniz güzel ama biraz e, sanki spesifik kalıyor. Direkt bunların 17'sini e, hedef alan girişten gelişmeye kadar, güzel örneklere kadar e, kişilere fikir veren, daha iyisini onlara ilham ettiren bir e, ders tarzında planlanabilir e, diye düşünüyorum. E, dediğim gibi lisans veya ön lisans da e, böyle bir ders seçme olarak seçme ders havuzuna hazırlanabilir, konulabilir. E, böylece e, öğrenciler daha iyi farkındalıkla büyüm şey, eğitimlerini tamamlamış olurlar. Kasım'dan sonra böyle bir çalışma yaparsak e, beraber çalışabiliriz yani böyle bir içerik hazırlama işte ders sunumu hazırlama gibi bir şey olursa olabilir Kasım'ın başından itibaren. Ya ben ee, de destek vermek istiyorum. Bir, bir de şey yapabiliriz yani böyle Türkçe e, bunun e, kendisini iyi yetiştiren bir akademisyen veya iki üç tane akademisyen onar dakikalık sunum yaptığı, belli konulara öncelik verdiği, atıyorum A akademisyeni e, 1, 5, 7 e, SDG numaralarını söylüyorum, hakkında konuşur. Bilmem e, B akademisyeni e, bilmem e, 17, 16, 12 falan gibi böyle numara verir kendi kendine. Onun üzerinde zamanını e, harcayacağı e, sunum hazırlayıp sunum yapabilir. Bir, bir derece o da ayrıca Türkçe farkındalığı artırır. Bu tarz şeylerle e, dediğim gibi e, üst üste koyacağız binaları. Bir anda çatısını yapmıyoruz biliyorsunuz yapılmıyor. Temeller atılıyor işte e, sütunlar kolonlar e, yerleştiriliyor demirler bağlanıyor vesaire derken çatıyla birlikte pencereler elektrik tesisatı vesaire oturulabilir hale geliyor. E, dolayısıyla biz de Böyle bir başlangıçla devamını gün be gün veya çeşitli programlarla artırarak devam ettirmemiz lazım diye düşünüyorum. Şimdilik söyleyeceklerim bu kadar. Başka söz alan yoksa böyle kapatalım. Zaten de iki saati geçti. Yok herhalde. Ben hepinize teşekkür ediyorum. Dediğim gibi uluslararası.